Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. This is the story. And I don't know, it may be apocryphal, but it's a famous baseball story. In 1962, Richie Ashburn and Elio Chacon were playing for the New York Mets, and they ran into a problem. Each other. Pop fly after pop fly, they would collide on the field. Ashburn, the veteran center fielder, tried to call Chacon off, but still, kabump. Until Richie found the key. Chacon, who was born in Venezuela, didn't speak much English. So Ashburn switched from saying, I got it, to saying, yo la tengo. It worked until Ashburn ran into Frank Thomas, who I guess didn't get the memo. Reportedly, Thomas stood up and said, what the hell is a yellow tango? That story ended up being the inspiration for one of alt-rock's great bands, Yola Tango. They've been around for almost 40 years, the pride of Hoboken, New Jersey. The band is made up of Georgia Hubley, James McNew, and my guest, Ira Kaplan. They're beloved by rock critics and artsy dads far and wide. They've just released their 17th album, This Stupid World. Before we get into my interview with Ira, let's hear a song off the new record, Fallout. I won't tell you how it's gonna be. I don't have what you want from me. I want to fall out of time. Beach back on the Ira Kaplan, welcome to Bullseye. I'm so happy to have you on the show. Happy to be here. Can I tell you that I... In my head, I always think of Yola Tango as a Mets band. <laughs> and I don't even know what that means exactly. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, you know, we're big fans, so that's, I'm, I'm comfortable with that, no matter what it means. I know how much you love the Mets broadcast team. That's something that many, many Mets fans share. Like, I, I think there are a lot of Rockstar stories about favorite sports teams that probably involve meeting, you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or whatever. And, you know, what I hear you excited about is meeting the the Mets play-by-play guy. Well, I, I do think, you know, that it's a big part of why it's so much fun to watch the games, win or lose. The, those three guys do such a, you know, I think it matters tremendously to them, you know, I think they're all baseball fans, obviously, and like to see good baseball. But I think there's a perspective just in the other things they talk about and in their tone of voice that, you know, it, it, it's, it is actually only baseball. <laughs> like it's, I don't know, it's just there, there's a tone to the broadcast that I have not heard hardly anywhere else. There, I, I wish I could remember what it was, but a, a few years ago, uh, George and I were driving our equipment back after a festival show, and it was a Sunday afternoon. So we just kept looking for baseball games on the radio. And, you know, you'd, one would come in for a couple of innings, and then we'd switch to another one. And probably at the time, didn't even care what I was listening to. But uh, there was one where they had a really great like rapport in that, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to be critical of others, but they sounded like they were having fun being at a baseball game. And uh, that's what I love about listening to Gary Cohen and Ron Darling and Keith Hernandez. Years ago, I was on my friend J. Keith Van Stratton's trivia podcast. And the premise of this trivia podcast is they bring a public figure on and they quiz them about something that they claim to be a nerd about. And then they bring on someone who is a great expert in that field to quiz them. And I had picked the San Francisco Giants and, you know, I'm standing there on stage. This is like a live recording in front of people. 
and they're like, okay, we're going to put our celebrity guest on the line for you, Jesse. And they, you know, it like clicked through and it was the Giants play-by-play announcer, John Miller. And I just about melted on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> and then he demolished you, right? Oh yeah. No, he tore me a new one. Yeah, absolutely. No, he, he, and the, the, the thing that made me think of announcers and talking to you is because the story that gave Yola Tango its name, which is this old Mets story, I heard as a sad nerd teenager, a 19-year-old I think I was, at a Society for American Baseball Research conference in maybe Phoenix. And it was the like the dinner speaker, you know, the headliner of the conference was John Miller, and he told that story. Wow. <laughs> I'm 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 a little stuck on a different detail that you went to a a saber uh, function, but by myself as an 18 year old, yeah, <laughs> I did. It's true. <laughs> Just hanging out with elderly guys who can't stop talking about the Brooklyn Dodgers. Yeah, and uh, wins against replacement. <laughs> it's comfortably pre wins against replacement. <laughs> let's talk. Let's talk a little bit about music. You're coming up on 40 years now Yeah, with Yola Tango. Does that ever stop you short? Do you ever count it up in your head? Uh, We're well aware that the 40th year approaches, uh, so I guess the answer is yes. How does it feel when you think about it? It feels great. I mean, it's unbelievable to me uh, that this was such a lark and... uh, the idea that we're still doing it and still love doing it. I mean, it's, it just seems like such a gift all the time that uh, it's remarkable. Was it really a lark? Well, kind of. I mean, I think George and I started, we played at a couple of parties with, with friends of ours, primarily in the New York band, uh, the DBs, and it was something we just loved we loved playing. We we were not in any way adept at doing it. So we just kind of kept to ourselves playing cover songs and tried to put a band together and eventually tried to write a song. But, you know, we didn't, weren't out to teach the world to sing or anything. You know, we just kind of, it, it was it was fun uh, and, and challenging. I mean, sometimes it wasn't fun at all because we felt so incapable of doing something we liked. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I would. Uh, a lark is not particularly an exaggeration. I think on the first record, your guitar is credited as like primitive guitar or something like that. I think naive. I think is maybe naive. The word. Yes, yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there were a few things that worked there. I mean, I, I've said this many times. The DBs and the feelies uh, were so important to our development as friends, as bands we loved, and and as their support. And the on Crazy Rhythms, they describe the guitar parts. You know, there's I, I can't remember what they are now, but there's there are all sorts of creative ways of getting around the word lead guitar, rhythm guitar. And there's no doubt in my mind I, w- I was thinking about that. But at the same time, I don't really think I was playing rhythm guitar and Dave Schramm certainly was playing lead guitar, but it, it just seemed a more descriptive way of describing what was going on. I think most people who are young adults playing in rock and roll bands, their ambitions are grandiose, right? Like, isn't the goal of starting a rock band to, like, rock out and rule the world, usually? Uh, I don't know. Is it? <laughs> you know, I, I hope what I'm about to say doesn't sound too canned because it does strike me as something I've said on a number of other occasions. But I think, you know, I mentioned the feelies and I mentioned the DBs and I just felt like at a certain point, the music that we cared about the most, those acts were not ruling the world. And, you know, on, on occasion, a group like, well, not a group like, REM would break through and but it all that always felt like such a fluke and it seemed to me pretty early on that 
a good strategy to have would be just to manage your expectations and try. And I think I've gotten, I know I've gotten better at this as life has gone on, but not really obsess about things that are out of your control. So what other people were going to make of our group and what lofty show business heights we were going to attain was largely not in our control. So it it just seemed like not a wise thing to focus on. If the movie Bedazzled has taught us anything, it's that <laughs> getting your wishes coming true don't always work out the way you think they will. Did you have wishes? Like, were there particular things that you were dreaming of? Even if it did, you think, gosh, it would be nice not to have a job? Kind of. I mean, probably. But the kind of work I did was so, uh, you know, it, it was a different time. And I, I never, fortunately, had to do, I, I never had an office job, ever. So there was no kind of take this job and shove it moment for me. Even when, when I was able to start living off the band, it just meant that I proofread and copy edited less and less trashy novels until I didn't do any. So uh, even that, as, as aspirations go, was, was not a particularly uh, evocative one. <laughs> with Ira Kaplan of Yola Tango after a quick break. Stay with us. It's Bullseye from MaximumFun.org and NPR. I'm Jesse Thorne. You're listening to Bullseye. My guest, Ira Kaplan, is co-founder of the band Yola Tango. We found this review that you wrote in the late 70s about an Elvis Costello concert in a newspaper called Soho Weekly News. And I'm going to read this little excerpt from it. And I'll tell you why as soon as I read, other than to embarrass you by reading something yeah, out loud. Yeah, I know. You, you, the, the pit in my stomach right now is... Uh, I'm sure you can hear it. (laughs) You did a great job. There's nothing particularly embarrassing in this. As for fears that a big hall would corrupt his music, forget it. Elvis and the attraction set up as close together as they could. The size of the stage be damned. Elitists may have been shocked by the inappropriate yells accompanying Allison, especially in Jersey, Natch. But the intensity of the performance belied the need for worry. Elvis wants to be more than a cult figure. It's no coincidence that he performed better in front of 3,000 people than he did when there were but 450 watching. And the, I'll tell you the reason why I liked it. It's like, what a winning attitude about a guy you love getting famous. <laughs> well, <laughs> You know what I mean? Well, you know, that, that, but I do think a lot of that goes back to that time when... I think there was that kind of proselytizing and uh, evangelizing, like, you know, how can you not hear how great the Ramones are? How can you not hear how great television is? Like, you know, and if only you would hear them, you would you would know too. And so there was, I think, a lot of that kind of, um, you know, maybe maybe later I got more selfish and wanted to keep uh, certain groups to myself, but um, but certainly not then. Um, it's clear that hearing music that moved you was so important, and, and not just hearing music that moved you, but like getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And 
you know, you were a 21 year old concert critic. Did you, ever, do you think you ever felt paralyzed by taste? Like, do you think that part of why when you started, you said you and Georgia never felt like you could make something that was good enough was because you were so, you know, you, you were so deeply committed as a consumer of music. Hmm. I don't know that I've ever thought of that. Uh, hmm. I don't know. I mean, I used to read, or probably still do, uh, but interviews with people who would say that, you know, everything on the radio is terrible. That's why I was all but forced to write my own songs so there would be something good out there. You know, that was just not <laughs> not part of my personality and, and not part of Georgia's. And uh, so I don't know that what you're saying sounds a little too like directly causal for me to be comfortable agreeing to it. I think we're just shy. How do you think you got through that? We just got more comfortable. I don't know. I mean, once again, I you know, I bring up the DBs and the feelies to have people we admired think we were doing something worthwhile meant a a lot to us. But the quantum leap is meeting James. And that's when, you know, when we became a band, just the three of us, and and especially because there were no day jobs, there were no uh, outside other bands. And we just started getting together and playing most afternoons and in Hoboken. And, and the place we played in like a complex, which, so if you went at night, there would be a lot of people playing and it wasn't like the perfect milieu for doing something quiet. But once it, we had the building to ourselves, we were able to do kind of whatever we wanted and just feeding off of each other and not only feeding off each other, but James has always been more uh, enthusiastic <laughs> about what we're doing than, than and, you know, it takes... George and I uh, longer to come around to something that it does him. And that made a big difference. Like somebody who sings so great and plays so great is just like being really encouraging. And just so when the three of us started working together, that just changed everything. And anything it didn't change, it allowed it to change later. Do you think the band would have been different if... Or do you think you even could have started a band when you were 18 instead of 28? I'm fudging the dates, but yeah, approximately. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, I've, that I have thought about that. And, you know, the answer is obviously yes. But I do think, certainly to go back to the first thing you asked about the longevity of the group, I don't think the fact that we started it so late in life is coincidental. I, I think as volatile as uh, particularly I could be and can be, I think it, it would have been even worse if I was younger. And um, so I think it, you know, could have happened, but it would have happened very differently. What kind of volatility are you talking about? Uh, just ask someone who knows me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear some music from the first Yola Tango album, Ride the Tiger from 1986. Uh, this is Big Sky. People lift up their heads and look up to the big sky. The big sky's too big to sympathize. Big sky's too wide. Are there things that you like and admire about the music that you made almost 40 years ago and things that make you feel weird or cringe? Uh, certainly the latter. Uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm at peace with <laughs> those records. You mentioned that you felt like the band came together or something like that 
when James McNew joined the band. That's not until the early 90s. And I, you know, I'm sorry to harp on this, but it's it's so unusual to feel like you were at the point in your life when most bands are falling apart and, you know, people are losing the adolescent passion that drove them to try and make a career in music. And you were just finding yours. Was it really just he was encouraging? Well, I mean, we were, I mean, different things happened along the way. Uh, I, th I think in whatever way, George and I were doing some things that that worked. Uh, we had <laughs> we started. Um, speaking of volatility, if we felt that uh, we were not getting the respect that we were due from a club, we just would instead of doing a, a set of songs, we would just take this two song medley which would be kind of maybe, it was long. It was like some of the longest things we would play at the time, maybe like 10 minutes, and stretch it out to an entire set and basically just play noise, which, you know, is probably not, you know, I don't think it's something we invented, but it was a big deal for us from a kind of personal statement of to, to just kind of assert ourselves in that way. And then on the other side of the spectrum, that we had, the, there was so much personnel change within the band, and at a certain point, uh, there was there was no band; it was just me and Georgia. And um, along the way, you know, prior to that, we would when we were on tour, we would sometimes play at a radio station or at a record store. You know, the sort of things one does to promote a show or a record. And we would do it as just the two of us, and we would basically sing cover songs. And, and Georgia, who didn't sing live maybe at all at that point, and she did very sparingly, sang a great deal on these record store and radio station shows. So we had a completely different repertoire of songs where we sang harmony together. And we thought, well, we don't have a band. Why don't we just record that repertoire and we were uh, we were on Coyote Records at the time, which was owned by Steve Fallon, who was the owner and booker of Maxwell's. And, and, and Steve thought that was kind of a bad idea because the previous record, President Yol Tango, had started to get more attention than any of our other records had gotten, sort of the, the rock songs on it. And he thought it was just too different from the previous record that it wasn't sound business sense. But we were like, well, you know, maybe we'll, <laughs> I guess we'll do it anyway. <laughs> and then that record, uh, you know, became such a successful record for us, the fake book record. Would, by then, Coyote was gone, so it came out on, on Bar None Records all in Hoboken. And so, I, you know, I think there, there was kind of growing confidence in what we were doing but you still felt like you changed when James joined the group. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the the difference, James plays on May I Sing With Me, but those were the songs that, by and large, we taught him when he started playing with us. Even when he started playing with us, the notion was he was playing in the band Christmas from Boston, and, and they were having their own like record company issues and were kind of on this forced hiatus. So James was just like filling in on a couple of tours with us, and we taught him a bunch of songs, including the ones that ended up on May I Sing With Me. But then we developed the songs on the record Painful, our first record on Matador. We developed them together over a long period of time. And, and that's the big sea change, is us working together and trying to figure out what we can do with the songs we're writing. And, and the songs went through a lot of permutations and a lot of energy went into that, learning that stuff. I mean, that time was also a time when the landscape of rock music changed so dramatically in that, you know, the idea of college rock became kind of alt rock and became the sort of 
very close to the last popular form of rock music, the last like chart topping form of, of rock music, that kind of alternative rock radio exploded in those same years, you know, 1991, 92, 93, 94 in there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It, it must've been odd because at that point you were both veterans and felt like newbies in a way. And also, you know, it wasn't just REM that was making weird, noisy records and like selling millions of them. Right. But even so, I would agree, you know, to go back to earlier things we were talking about, that there were feelings of, well, maybe we could break through in a, in a bigger way. But on the other hand, most of the bands that were were not bands that we really felt like, you know, look at them. They did it. Why not us? I think even then, it, we did not feel part of, uh, uh, with some exceptions that I sort of don't really want to name because I don't really want to be that specific. But most of those groups, I think, that hit the top of the charts, we didn't feel that much of an affinity for. Let's hear some Yola Tango from the mid-90s, getting into the late 90s from the album I Can Hear the Heart Beating is One. This is Autumn Sweater. Ira, are there things that you think you are better than ever at now? <laughs> oh, yeah, everybody. Who, what artist, what performer isn't deluding themselves to think that they've never been better? Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I was listening to that, and the cringing I did when you played Big Sky, uh, particularly listening to myself sing, and I listened to that, and I enjoyed hearing myself sing it. And I think about like Roger Mutno and because that was the that was the third record we recorded with Roger. And a, another thing that really helped everything was having the time to make records and you know, instead of being on this like tight budget where you just kind of go in there and record the song that you've worked out as best you can and then get out, like starting with painful which we did with Roger and Fred Brockman, and then continuing in a progression on the many records we did subsequent to Painful with Roger, we had a pretty generous amount of studio time and could experiment. And when a song like Autumn Sweater, I, I can remember being dissatisfied with the way I sounded singing. And, but Roger, who had always just loved just rolling up his sleeves and helping to find a creative way to work around things that, you know, I couldn't really put into words. So I'd, I wouldn't be surprised if James remembers, and I'm sure Roger does, just what microphone I'm singing into there. But it's it's some weird microphone, and it was kind of like, well, try this. and it, And it ended up capturing... A sound and a, and a helping me express an emotion that <laughs> that I don't mind hearing all these years later. <laughs> we'll finish up with Yola Tango's Ira Kaplan in just a minute. After the break, he's not an old guy yet, but he can see it coming around the corner. So what kind of old guy musician does Ira Kaplan want to be? A back-to-the-roots blues man? Maybe... Guy who makes ambient album? Join a supergroup with Jeff Lynn. You'll never know. Unless you listen to the rest of this episode. It's Bullseye from MaximumFun.org and NPR. Somewhere in an alternate universe where Hollywood is smarter. And the Emmy nominees for Outstanding Comedy Series are... Jet Pacula. Airport Marriott. Thruple. Dear America, We've Seen You Naked, and Allah in the Family. 
In our stupid universe, you can't see any of these shows, but you can listen to them on Dead Pilot Society, the podcast that brings you hilarious comedy pilots that the networks and streamers bought but never made. Journey to the alternate television universe of Dead Pilot Society on MaximumFun.org. Welcome back to Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. If you're just joining us, my guest is Ira Kaplan. He's a guitarist and singer and the front man of the beloved New Jersey band Yola Tango. Their latest album, which is their 17th, is called This Stupid World. It's out now. Let's hear the rest of our conversation. All these years later, the three of you are, for pretty much the first time, making your own records. Um, what's that like for you? Well, it, it's been the culmination of a process. We James has always been the person documenting what we're doing at rehearsal, even if it became just recording some of our rehearsals on a four-track cassette player or a mini-disc player. And then, you know, with the advent of Pro Tools, we started making more elaborate demos, and we were fortunate somebody helped us get some much better equipment. So, you know, the recordings we were making got more and more elaborate to the point that when we recorded the record Fade with John McIntyre in Chicago, we brought some pretty elaborate demos that James had recorded and ended up using quite a few of them, the the tracks on, on the finished record. And then when we got back together to start making, well, I mean, we're always recording things, even if we don't know that we're making a record. So when we decided maybe it was time to think about the record that became There's a Riot Going On. We had this whole backlog of recordings that we started listening to and thinking about what we could do with them. And I think at a certain point in the process, we thought we would do what we did on Fade, which is just bring a bunch of stuff to John and build it up from there. But then we thought, well, you know, maybe we like what we're doing and we can skip that part of the process. We'll we'll mix the record with John. And we recorded the whole thing, almost the whole thing ourselves, a couple of vocals and maybe a couple more overdubs with John. And then on this last record, there again, we just thought, okay, we'll record it and then we'll go somewhere and mix it. And then, you know, especially because James just dives into the recording and the mixing and, you know, we'd show up at practice and he would, you know, tell us all the the mixing and mic techniques he'd been reading about the night before. So it it just, it wasn't something we actually planned on doing. It was just something we kind of fell into doing. And given the logistics of the last few years, it was, it worked out perfectly to record music that way. I mean, it's certainly been a strange time, lonely for a lot of people. And it's narrowed a lot of our our circles. It must be nice to feel like you had some some agency to make something in that context. Oh, it was amazing. Even before we started working on The Stupid World, when we figured out very quickly that, well, there's only three of us and two of us are already living together. So for us to get together is really not a rash, unsafe thing to do. So we started getting together a couple times a week and, you know, just on a personal level and a, and a social level, it mattered so much and it was so great just to kind of have somebody else to talk to. And then we would we'd just make some music with no uh, thought other than, you know, it was almost like a just part of being social is let's play something and thought, oh, you know, this this is actually not just good therapy. It, it, I kind of like it. And and we shared it with Matador to see if they were interested in putting it out like as a digital piece. And they were enthusiastic enough about what they heard. And they said, well, you know, why not make a whole record of it? We're like, okay. And so we, we put out this thing... Uh, of just these 
one track recordings. James was just using one microphone that we were doing in our rehearsal space during the the height of the lockdown, just to kind of keep us as close to sane as possible. Have you thought about what kind of um, old guy musician you'd like to be? <laughs> I think I am an old guy musician. You're on the edge, Ira. I'm going to give you a minute to, to look back on middle-aged musician and look look forward on old guy musician. Well, I don't know. I'm uh, I'm getting a lot of senior discounts when I go shopping, so... <laughs> But what do you think? What what would you like to be? I don't know. I just want to keep whatever I enjoy. I mean, that's really the, the um, you know, we're in a very envious position. We do what we want, and, um, and that's great. So I just want to keep doing what I want to do. I mean, I, I, you know, one of the things that's kind of amazing— and I don't take lightly, is how much the three of us agree on. And um, that's lasted a long time, and, you know, maybe it won't. Maybe uh, as we get older, the agendas will diverge a little more. So, uh, you know, I, I hope we find a, a consensus, continue to find a consensus, and just do what makes us happy. Well, I, I sure appreciate you doing this. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, my pleasure. Ira Kaplan of Yola Tengo. Their new album is This Stupid World. It's amazing how much great music they have made in their career. They're kicking off an eight-night Hanukkah residency at the Bowery Ballroom in New York this week. The shows are all sold out, but don't worry. They're also gearing up for a big tour in February. We'll have more information about that on the Bullseye page at MaximumFun.org. Believe it or not, I happen to be looking for what the first episode of our show to be podcast was, or at least the oldest episode in our original podcast feed. And it had Ira Kaplan on it. 18 years ago. Wowie zowie. Let's go out on one more song from This Stupid World, Apology Letter. That's the end of another episode of Bullseye Bullseye, created from the homes of me and the staff of Maximum Fun in and around greater Los Angeles, California. I've been having a nice time driving my tiny Japanese van around, but my car's been in the shop for a month, and I just got it back, and uh, I'm happy to drive on the freeway again. Our show is produced by Speaking Into Microphones. Our senior producer is Kevin Ferguson. Our producers are Jesus Ambrosio and Richard Roby. Our production fellow at Maximum Fun is Brianna Paz. We get booking help from Mara Davis. Our interstitial music is by Dan Wally, DJW. Our theme song is called Huddle Formation, written and recorded by the Go Team. Thanks to them and thanks to their label, Memphis Industries. Bullseye is on Instagram. We share interview highlights, behind-the-scenes looks, and more at Bullseye with Jesse Thorne. We're also on Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. And I think that's about it. Just remember, all great radio hosts have a signature sign-off. Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. NPR.